Welcome to Meet Your Neighbor. We're here at the beautiful Hopkinton YMCA today and we are about to sit down and have an interview outdoors with Max von Baca, who recently graduated from Hopkinton High and also received his Eagle Scout honor. Hi Max. Hi. Uh, it's good to have you here meeting with us at the YMCA in Hopkinton today. Uh, we had asked uh, where you might feel comfortable having an interview for ne Meet Your Neighbor in Hopkinton, a place that has connection for you, and you suggested the YMCA. Can you tell a little bit about why? Sure. Why the why? <laughs> <laughs> well, for a, a long time, um, one of the biggest things I've been involved in has been the Boy Scouts of America. And recently, we've chosen the YMCA to be the place where we have our troop meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, we had added at Elmwood School for a while, just trying to meet in the cafeteria. But the Y gives us the opportunity to really be outdoors, kind of mm -hmm. do a lot more hands-on activities. And now we have our meetings uh, down at one of the lodges at the Y. Ah, okay. I understand you recently received an honor with the Scouts. Can you tell a little bit about that? And congratulations Thank in you. advance. <laughs> uh, well, I recently uh, had my board of review for my Eagle Scout rank. Mm -hmm. And what that is basically is uh, to become an Eagle Scout, there are a bunch of requirements that need to be accomplished. And when that's done, and it has to be done before your 18th birthday, there is a board of important people in scouting in the, in the community and in the district who review all those accomplishments and then call you in for about an hour interview. And they ask questions about things you've done, the experiences you've had, what you've learned from scouting. And if they feel that all the accomplishments are satisfactory and that this is someone who has really earned the rank of Eagle, mm -hmm. then they, they officially grant uh, grant you that uh -huh. achievement. And that is what you were granted. Yes. Uh, just last week, was that? Yeah, about a week ago. Uh-huh. Well, congratulations to you. It Thank sounds you. a bit like uh, the process of a job. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. similar for sure. Mm. Uh-huh. Well, that's great. And so you've been involved with Scouts for how many years? Uh, well, with the Boy Scouts since fifth grade. And then mm -hmm. even before that, with the Cub Scouts in town since I was probably Eight years old. Eight years so. old, okay. So that's uh, 10 years or more now mm. at this point. Mm -hmm. Wow, well that's quite a commitment. Um, and uh, I know you uh, learn a great deal, uh, not only about uh, nature and skills outdoors, but a lot of life skills as well, and also about survival. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I understand recently you uh, came to assistance uh, with a trip out west. I heard this from a woman in a business meeting recently who was uh, raving uh, your name as assisting in a circumstance that happened and involving a scout in trouble. Could you tell a little about that? Sure. Uh, well, in one of the biggest trips our troop has ever done, we uh, went to Yosemite mm -hmm. recently. We had a 50 mile hike that we did, kind of a circuit out there. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. But what happened was there were a bunch of fallen trees uh, on the path that we weren't aware of since they were pretty far from mm. the start of our hike, pretty far from the ranger stations. So we had no way of getting a heads up about that situation. Mm -hmm. So what we were able to do is we were able to kind of go off trail for a bit, avoid the worst of the fallen trees, and then make our way back towards the trail. Mm. Uh, but just near the end, as we were getting the last of the scouts through the trees, uh, one of the boys slipped and twisted his ankle oh. pretty badly. Uh -huh. wow. And uh, since we had, since we were out there for about a week, all the scouts were wearing pretty heavy packs. And with his mm -hmm. twisted ankle, he wasn't able to carry that anymore. So a couple of the other older boys and myself uh, took his pack and strapped it on the back of ours for about uh, five, 10 miles each. Wow. And we were able to carry that. And he was able to get through, luckily, without that heavy weight. He was able to kind of uh, gingerly hike the rest of the trail. Wow. Wow. And so everyone made it fine. Everybody made it through all right, yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. Well, uh, that was really fortunate that uh, you had problem solved in that way uh, yourself and together as a group and helped each other out. And did you meet any grizzlies? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. We had our fingers right. crossed. But how it's uh -huh. actually done when you go on a long hike like that is there are canisters that mm -hmm. you put all your food in before you go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely crucial. The mm -hmm. rangers enforce that over and over again. That uh -huh. If uh -huh. you don't have your food in those canisters, the bears will come. Uh -huh. and wow. I thought it was kind of funny, actually. One of the things they said was, 
the bear canister will keep the bear out of your food for about three hours. Mm -hmm. And we asked why that specific number, and the ranger said, after about three hours, the bear will realize that it can just smash the canister into things. Mm -hmm. And when the bear starts doing that, the canister will break. Because wow. there's no uh -huh. way we can make it strong enough to withstand wow. that kind of, uh, kind of punishment. Uh -huh. So no wonder there is such uh, concern in giving warnings for people who travel around where grizzlies are. Yeah, you definitely got to be safe. Yeah. Ha and uh, you learn about orienteering, mm -hmm. uh, so you were able to figure your way around out there, even though there were trees that yep. uh, got you off path. That's an important skill that Certainly. stays with you, whether you're in San Francisco, maybe, <laughs> or in the woods, or mm -hmm. Hopkinton in the back trails. That's right. Uh, what else would you say uh, for outdoor survival and life skills are some of the maybe major things you've learned from your years in Scouts? Well, as far as life skills, I think a big part of the program has always been interacting with the other boys in the group. Mm -hmm. And that leadership is a big aspect of that. Um, there's a whole Scout-led aspect of Boy Scouts, a whole hierarchy of leadership and um, there's a single senior patrol leader, an assistant senior patrol leader, and below them, individual patrol leaders that he can delegate to. And I think that teaches boys a lot of leadership skills. Mm -hmm. It teaches them how to work with other kids, how to delegate responsibilities, and how to have those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely something that I've garnered from the program. I mm -hmm. think that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds uh, like a lot in just that uh, response of uh, leadership, responsibility, community, uh, and uh, the connection to all of that through Scouts. Uh, do you see this as a movement that is growing uh, or is it uh, diminishing uh, in our society? I, I think it's still growing. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that there isn't the glamour for Boy Scouts yeah. that it had in the past, mm -hmm. uh, especially during the, uh, the middle of the 1900s during World War II and slightly after, mm -hmm. when it was really a popular program. It was something that whole communities looked to with admiration and respect. And I think it has diminished slightly in that regard, mm -hmm. but as far as actual membership and people participating in the organization, I think it's still growing. Mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. still recognize that this is a place where I can bring my son and he will be able to learn these valuable skills. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know and hopeful and uh, to hear in you and how you uh, speak of it so highly. And hopefully that will reverberate out uh, yeah. more, uh, the hope for future generations and learning such important skills. Did you grow up here in Hopkinton? Yep, I was uh, born right here. I've lived here my uh, entire life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, what would you say that you especially have enjoyed or appreciated growing up in our town? Well, I think this town definitely has a sense of community that's really special. That mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of support from a lot of different sources for people. And I I've, I've definitely think I've seen that benefit. In that mm -hmm. there are plenty of organizations for people to go to that support them. And whether it's supporting children and giving them things to do and keeping them active, or supporting needy members of the community that. Um, such as the charities that we have or the mm -hmm. respite center or any of these organizations that are really a big part of our town and are really visible in our town and that provides a sense of community mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. sense of support that i think is very valuable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love that that is good to hear and hopefully continue on mm -hmm. as we grow and change in different ways uh, and uh, would you have any suggestions for uh, how it would be best to support young people, um, you know, uh, growing up here, graduating this year? Congratulations again. Thank you. Um, any suggestions before you move on? I know you're going to Harvard uh, soon. So any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I would say that one of the biggest problems I've seen as mm -hmm. far as um, youth interaction in this town is within the the context of schools that I've seen with a lot of my friends and classmates um, people who have just become disengaged because they really don't feel that the school has anything to offer them the school is interested in them as an individual and I think it's a difficult problem it's a problem with education in general that mm -hmm. kids in general don't get really enthusiastic about school mm -hmm. too often uh, and I think perhaps to solve that, um, 
is to bring students more in on the dialogue, students a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. That we have certain organizations in the high school, for example, certain ways in, in which students can get involved and try to make changes, but for the most part, you don't see a whole lot of student-led changes being mm -hmm. done in the school. Mm -hmm. That you don't hear about the things student council is doing to improve student life. You don't get a feel that students actually have a power to change mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then the result of that is when a student feels that there's a problem, they just feel powerless. And instead mm -hmm. of trying to change that problem and improve their situation and improve the situation of their classmates, they just get disengaged. Mm -hmm. They think, what's the point? This isn't about me. And they, they lose an interest in school in general. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that's an issue. Mm -hmm. That's a, a, a very big missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Since we, our schools, in reality, do have a lot to offer. It's mm -hmm. a strong mm -hmm. program. There's a lot I've loved about the program. But if kids feel that the program isn't worth their time, they're not mm -hmm. going to get any benefit mm -hmm. from it. Well, that's uh, valuable to know. So thank you for that. Uh, what do you think made the difference for you in engaging so much in the academic scene in Hopkinton? Uh, I know you've had many honors and awards and you are extraordinary in your achievements academically. I uh, understand there's a banner with your name. Oh, yes. There. So another congratulations. But what do you think? Uh, well, I think it was a combination of two things. Um, first of all was just the influence of my family. Hmm. That. Um, my parents, of course, and my grandparents have always been very enthusiastic about education and about learning. That from a very young age, um, for birthdays and Christmas, my grandfather would give me books, mm -hmm. just so many books, uh, so much that it became a bit of a running joke in our family. But mm -hmm. that excitement about learning mm -hmm. from, that, uh, from my family really was contagious. Mm -hmm. And it got me in, to be excited about learning as well. Um, I think the other thing is I've had some very extraordinary teachers. Mm -hmm. that I've had some that were lackluster for sure, mm -hmm. but or from the beginning I had some teachers that really inspired me and got me excited starting like, from kindergarten mm -hmm. actually. My mm -hmm. kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Rufo, was absolutely fantastic. Uh -huh. Got me started on the right track and that continued for the rest of my education. That mm -hmm. Whenever I got frustrated or overwhelmed, there was always this teacher to turn to mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that really got me through and taught me that this education program has a lot to offer mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. it's something I could get excited about. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good to hear and uh, I think it would be good for other people uh, in your life and uh, other uh, students' lives here and how to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And one of my questions was uh, mentors for you. If you, there were any particular mentors you'd identify or is it more general because there have been so many? Uh, well, while there have been many, there are definitely a few that jump out. Mm -hmm. um, from my high school career, I think of uh, Mr. Michael Sullivan, mm -hmm. who is a, a teacher of psychology at the high school as well as the, um, the advisor for the philosophy club. And even though his classes are typically for juniors and seniors, as soon as I entered the school and a lot of uh, older students suggested philosophy club to me, I really felt that I could make a connection with him and this was someone who had a lot of knowledge to offer mm -hmm. and offered mm -hmm. it in a, in a hilarious, fascinating, interesting way. Mm -hmm. And he was definitely someone I've looked up to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I think the biggest reason for that is because he is able to do what even great teachers are not able to do in the sense that he takes people who are disengaged mm -hmm. and re-engages them wow. and gets them excited all over again. Mm -hmm. And I just respect that so much. I mm -hmm. think he's really made a positive difference in the school. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think Mrs. Nancy Clark, mm -hmm. who just retired at the end of this year, uh, who I was lucky enough for, to have for two years, sophomore and junior year for U.S. history, mm -hmm. who just has a over-the-top contagious passion for her subject, uh -huh. that she gets excited about every chapter mm -hmm. and every term, mm -hmm. and that got us excited. Mm -hmm. That got us to be making jokes about terms and really engaging with the material in a way that you don't get in every class. Mm -hmm. And she, I definitely respect her for mm -hmm. that, and she's been a, a mentor to me. I've heard so much about both, and that is good to hear how they have make such influence in mentoring ways. Uh, so uh, that's good to know also. Uh, there's so much to talk about uh, going on. Uh, how about 
uh, academically uh, for you, was there anything else um, that of significance in just graduating and looking at your years of academics uh, that you would, one thing maybe you would want to say about your experience uh, in, in the schools there? Uh, you had great teachers, that makes a difference. Family interest makes a difference. Did you have a favorite book? Uh, I would think one of my favorite books, apart from, of course, 1984. You can't, you can't mm -hmm. resist George Orwell. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I think yeah. Upton Sinclair's The Jungle mm -hmm. was really an interesting read for me and it kind of opened my eyes to a new way of interacting with the world and bringing about positive change that I hadn't really seen before. Mm -hmm. And that seeing how he used this new method mm -hmm. to bring about a massive change in a way that the way this country was heading mm -hmm. was really inspiring uh -huh. for me and exciting. Uh -huh. Sounds like political interests <laughs> in, as well as literary. Certainly on the list. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know not only uh, academically uh, how much you have invested and contributed uh, to the scene, but you've been involved in other extracurricular uh, over in Hopkinton as well. What were some of the things you've been involved with? Uh, well, as I was mentioning before, a big part has always been Mr. Sullivan's Philosophy mm -hmm. Club. Yeah. Actually, this Saturday we're going to have a meeting on the Common. Ah, uh -huh. the famous meeting on the Common. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, other than that, Model United Nations is something I kind of got into starting in my sophomore year. Involving debating? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, those have always been the th kind of the things that have drawn me in, the mm -hmm. things where I could debate ideas and issues and kind of challenge the way I think and challenge the way I can present my opinions to other people. Mm, mm -hmm. And Model United Nations has really shown me that that debating world issues and trying to bring about change is something that really fascinates me mm -hmm. and is something that is important to me. That mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. even though we don't really see perhaps so much uh, positive change coming from these organizations and we can be frustrated there is a potential to do so. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not something that I would feel useless working at, that I feel that if I was to pursue something in that area, it's an area where I could make some positive changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, all that from UN and mm -hmm. Philosophy Club. And then there was one other organization you've been a part oh, of, yes. right? Um, Very important to you. <laughs> uh, from the beginning of my freshman year, I've been playing Ultimate Frisbee. Ah, mm -hmm. that, <laughs> Um, um, what does that involve for those who do not know sure. uh, beyond a frisbee tossing? <laughs> yeah, the game of ultimate uh, is basically kind of a soccer football hybrid mm -hmm. in the sense that you pass the frisbee down the field and while you have the frisbee you can't run with it but your teammates do and you get it to your other teammates and if there's a catch made in the end zone you score a point ah. uh, while the other team tries to intercept or just knock down the frisbee and move down their end of the field. Mm -hmm. It's a very fast-moving game, mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I really like about it, and it's actually in the official rules for the game, okay. is that there's a, there's a whole area called the spirit of the game, mm. and that's where Frisbee sets itself apart, that it is unofficiated, mm -hmm. it's completely just by the goodwill of the players, and it's very relaxed. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be hyper-competitive, mm -hmm. even though people play hard, and it's an intense game. Everybody is meant to remember that we're all here to have a good time. Mm -hmm. We're all here to just relax. And that's the thing that drew, drew me to it from, from the start. Mm -hmm. That I had played a lot of other sports in town. I had played some baseball, I had run some track. Um, and while those were a workout and they mm -hmm. were often fun, what I often didn't like about them was the strictness to mm -hmm. their schedules and to their play that, I don't know, took the fun out of the, the pure enjoyment out of the game, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. game. And that's never been a problem with Frisbee. Mm -hmm. Frisbee has always been, we've made it a point of making our team a relaxed team, a fun team where we just go out and we play and we'll come back and we'll practice, but it's never, it doesn't have that aspect of strictness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like that especially because in so much else that I'm involved in, yeah. I have that pressure. Mm -hmm. I have that, um, the rules and the, the strictness, I keep mm -hmm. using the word, but. Mm -hmm. And then I can go to Frisbee and I can kind of leave that rigor behind mm -hmm. and just kind of forget all, all else and just relax and throw the Frisbee around. Mm. Oh, that sounds good. I wish we had that back in time. <laughs> that sounds like a good thing and I hope that is something that grows in momentum like Scouts as yeah. we're 
all these things you've been involved with, you are endorsing well. <laughs> um, and so uh, what you love about Ultimate Frisbee, are you bringing that on your way to Harvard? You'll be going there, what, in a month? In now? a month, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, will you be playing Ultimate Frisbee there? Uh, well, <laughs> from what I hear mm -hmm. um, from friends in college, past teammates who have gone on, in, on the college level there are kind of two aspects of Frisbee. That there is Frisbee more like a varsity sport, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there are strict practices and you travel to other schools and you play games. And then there's Frisbee more on the intramural or club level, mm -hmm. where it's still just kind of relaxed. It's, hey, if you like playing Frisbee, come on out, we'll have a game today. Mm -hmm. And I think of the two, I'd definitely be more interested in the latter. Uh -huh, just other yeah. people who like the sport and like to relax and have a good time, mm -hmm. just coming out to play Frisbee. And I hope I'll still be able to find places to do that, because mm -hmm. that's definitely a, a relaxing thing that I'd like to continue doing. All right. Well, what do you hope to achieve over there at Harvard? Uh, well, the biggest thing is um, to kind of narrow my focus. That there are so many different things that I, I'd like to be in, to, to study mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pursue moving forward. That I, at Harvard, I hope to try all those things mm -hmm. and then really distinguish one path that I'll pursue further moving forward. Yeah. An area of study or a, a future job interest that will really become more of a, a central focus mm -hmm. uh, for my life. That does not really exist right now. Uh, um, uh -huh. And that's one of the things I like about uh, going to the school that I'm going to, that I'll, whatever area I end up studying, mm -hmm. whatever program I end up pursuing, it'll be strong. Mm -hmm. And I'll be able to get a lot from that program. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very comforting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it sounds very good, the path that you're on and uh, all that you're bringing to it. Uh, it looks good, uh, so I hope you enjoy it wherever it leads you. Um, I know we only have a few minutes more. I was wondering if you have maybe a two-minute favorite story of life, of your sure. life to tell, because I know you're also a good natural storyteller. <laughs> well, there's one, actually, that um, I told at the Zen Mothra ah, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. a couple months ago. That it's, an, it's a story from a uh, scouting summer camp that I just think is both interesting but really telling on why scouting is such an amazing program. Mm. And what is that? Uh, well... If you can do it maybe in one and a half minute? Sure. Uh, well, at summer camp there was uh, the waterfront program. And one day a bunch of friends of mine were at the, pr the waterfront when the camp director came to us and asked if we'd like to do something unorthodox. Mm -hmm. So I volunteered and he mm -hmm. took me aside and he said, we're doing the lifeguards drill today and we're gonna pretend like you have disappeared in the waterfront. And I suppose I said, okay, what do you need me to do? Uh -huh. And he said, after about five minutes, I want you to swim under the dock. Mm -hmm. There's an air bubble under there, you're just gonna wait under there and your buddy, because the whole scouting program is based on the buddy system, your buddy's gonna tell the lifeguard that he can't find you. And they're gonna go into their emergency protocol and they're gonna pull you out and it'll be great. And I said, sure, sounds mm -hmm. good. Uh, so we went in and I swam under the dock and uh, my friend Bill Warner went up to the lifeguard and said, I can't find my buddy. I left my glasses on the shore. I don't know if he's just around and I can't see him, but I can't find him. So they called for me, they didn't find me. They got everybody out of the water. And the nerve wracking part with that was that they climbed up on the dock uh -huh. And the dock started oh. to sink, and my air bubble started to uh -oh. shrink. Uh -oh. uh, but luckily, <laughs> the camp director <laughs> uh -huh. realized just in time and shouted, "Off the dock!" <laughs> so, <laughs> crisis was averted. Uh. But um, so they took all the scouts. They brought them to a separate area. The lifeguards came in. They pulled me out from under the dock and brought me to shore. Did some tests to make sure I was all right. And then the camp director came, told them it was all a drill, and sent me off to meet my troop. And I thought that would just be the end of it. Mm. But as I walked to where my troop was waiting to hear what, what, what had happened, I looked and half the troop was in tears. I had heard that a friend of mine, Ryan Webster, had kind of fought with the scoutmasters trying to jump in and look wow. for me. Uh -huh. um, his little brother, Sean, was the most hysterical of all because he had kicked something in the water right, after, right before um, my friend Bill said he couldn't find me. He was worried that it was my head that he had kicked. Oh. <laughs> that, 
This um, was getting pretty intense. Yeah, my little brother, of course, was oh, sure. devastated. Yeah. He was yeah. very worried. Um, and it, it was touching. Yeah. It really was that uh -huh. to see that this whole group of boys cared so much mm. and was, uh, I don't know, was, was so close a group of mm. boys that are, were diverse in interests, mm -hmm. diverse in backgrounds, and might not have become friends if it was not for this program. Wow. Likely wouldn't have, mm -hmm. a variety of ages as well, but was brought, so brought together by this program yeah. and cared about each other so deeply because of this program. Mm -hmm. A hard way to find out, certainly, in a way. Certainly, certainly. Unintended, but very powerful and another important learning uh, mm -hmm. lesson for us in the world. And as we close now, uh, one last thing. If I know you care deeply, you said, about the world and hope to contribute in some way. Do you have one overall wish? You might have many for <laughs> our world and where we are, where we're going. Anything that come to mind for you? Uh, well, kind of related to this issue, um, there was a project we did at the end of senior year uh, regarding a political party that we would create. Mm -hmm. And the party I created was based on two ideas, based on the Declaration of Independence's idea of a pr the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. as well as uh, Abraham Maslow's humanist idea mm -hmm. of the hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And what I argued in that political party was that if we really want all people to be able to pursue happiness, mm -hmm. then there are certain basic needs that need to be met first. And I, I um, specifically looked at the first two rungs of the, the hierarchy of needs that Maslow described. The basic mm -hmm. human needs of food and water and shelter, and above that, the need of safety. Mm -hmm. That you need to feel not only physically safe, mm -hmm. safe from external threats, but safe in your lifestyle. You need to feel secure that you're not going to lose everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's an ambitious goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's going to be far from easy to accomplish, but I feel that as a general goal for our country and for our world to, to try to assure those basic needs mm -hmm. for all people is something, is an ambitious thing that we should strive for. Mm, and um, then. That's uh, beautifully said and I will vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I think uh, that uh, wraps it up for us for time. Well, thank you. So much covered in a uh, half hour, but thank you. Very interesting and I wish you the best at Harvard Thanks and beyond. So much.